Uh, I'm really excited to be here. It's my first go for con. Um, thank you so much for coming to, to see this talk. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Liz. I work for a company called Aqua Security. Uh, we do, well, we help enterprises keep their container deployments secure. And so, yeah, I'm, as John says, pretty into containers. And I think a few of you have seen that talk where I wrote a container from scratch. And in that talk, I will have said something like, we use syscalls to set up namespaces for the container. And I said that you know, a few times, heard myself say it, and thought, I actually really want to understand what I mean when I say this word syscalls. What am I really talking about? So over the last few months, I've done quite a bit of uh, playing and experimentation with syscalls. And hopefully, I understand them a little bit better, certainly a lot better than I used to. And I want to share that with you this morning here. So we'll talk a bit about syscalls. We'll talk about how they work. We will, of course, do a bit of coding. We'll uh, write some code and sort of dig into some of the things we can do with ptrace. And then we'll wrap up with uh, some of the things that you can do to enhance security with syscalls. So like any good citizen of the internet, I want to find out what syscalls are, so I look them up on Wikipedia. And I get a pretty good definition here. System call is the way that a program, your program, your application, running in user space, it's the way that it requests services from the kernel of the operating system it's running on. So your user space code really can't do very much by itself. Every time it wants to access things like hardware, it needs the kernel, which is the only thing that's privileged to actually access those things, to do it on its behalf. You need syscalls every time you access a file, every time you access a device, even writing to the screen, you're going to need the help that a syscall gives you from the kernel. You can't start a process. You certainly can't do anything like networking. You can't even find out the time without this help from the kernel, even though you probably don't, you know, unless you're sort of specialized in that area, you don't really think about these syscalls. They're all just handled for you. But let's see what's going on. Let's see some of them in action. So there's a nice Linux utility called strace. We've got a very, very simple hello, well, not world. We'll say hello gophercon uh, application. And we'll just very quickly see what strace tells us about it. So we'll build it, and we simply run it. And we see, ooh, loads of system calls. Now, I could walk through this and tell you what all of these system calls do, but it would be really, really dull. And we, you know, you want to have some lunch soon, right? So let's kind of skip over some of these. You can ask me about them later if you really, really want to know. We get down here to where the work, the interesting things are happening in a system call called write. And we can see that that's where it does the work. This is the system call that's writing the text we wanted onto the screen. So how did we get there from my format print line here? So, well, let's find out. So print line calls f print line, passing in stood out. f print line uh, does some stuff, but the interesting thing is this w write command. We'll look at uh, w is stood out. So we'll find out what that is. Stood out is a new file. File, it's an exported file, internal file. We go in here. We'll search for um, that write function. And here, finally, at long last, under all those le levels, we'll see something called syscall. So you have to go through all those steps before we got to the syscall package, which is going to call write. Golang syscall package. Let's have a look at that. OK, so the documentation tells us that syscall is the interface to the low-level operating system primitives. It goes on to say that the implementation varies by operating system and by the hardware that you're running on. 
It also goes on to say, please don't use this if you can use a higher level package, if, if something higher level is available. And then it kind of rounds off by saying, if you want to know any more details about this, you're going to have to go and look at the man pages for the appropriate operating system. So from here on in, we're looking at Linux man pages to find out what's going on. OK. Inside the, uh, the syscall package, there's some operating system specific files. And there's a whole bunch of auto-generated files that uh, depend on the OS and the platform you're running on. And if we take write as an example, we can see what, what that function actually looks like. This is one of the auto-generated ones. And we can see in there this function syscall. So all of these syscalls are kind of boiling down to one function called syscall. And the first parameter to that, to that function is an identifier to say which of the system calls you want to run. In this case, it's syswrite. There were like 303 of these on Linux. Some of them are really esoteric, and some of them are, you know, read, write, open, close. We can take a pretty good guess at what kind of things those are doing. So every time we call a system code, what's happening? We'll check with the man page. Man page says, syscall saves the CPU registers before making the system call. And it restores the registers after it returns. And it says a little bit about error handling. But what it doesn't say is what happens between the before making the system call and the after making the system call. I think there's a pretty big gap that I would like to understand better. So I researched it. What actually happens inside that syscall function? Syscall writes. First of all, that um, identifier for the, the system call that we want to actually call into a register, the AX register, if it happens to be an x86 platform. And then depending on which system call it is that we're going to call, there will be different parameters. So for example, if we want to read from a file, we're going to use sysread. That gives us the code that we're going to write into um, the AX register. We're also going to pass in. Um, a file descriptor and a pointer to where we want the, the data to be written in memory and uh, an indicator of how, how much data we want written. So those are all passed in through some registers. So syscall has set up those values in the registers. And then it issues a trap, like a, an interrupt, to say, OK, kernel, I need you to do something for me. Please go away and run the system call code. So the kernel can come along and uh, get these values from the registers. It knows which bits of code it needs to run based on uh, what that system call code is. It does the thing that it needs to do, like reading the data and putting it into the appropriate place in memory. And then it puts the return value into the AX register again. And then it signals to user space code, OK, you can carry on now. I have done my work. So all system call are basically done in the same way. There's this trap. Whatever hardware you're on, well, different hardwares have different registers. They don't all have registers called AX and DI and SI and what have you. So there's a table here that tells us for different platforms, how do you populate those uh, registers um, with the different arguments? And that's why we have uh, hardware-specific versions of the, the, the files in the syscall package so that they can write the parameters into the right registers. So syscalls are really an, a portability layer, if you like. It's what allows Linux to run on all these different uh, hardware environments. And it's also something we can emulate. If we can emulate the syscall interface, we can uh, allow all sorts of Linux code to run on top of that interface. And that's exactly what Microsoft did when they, uh, when they support the Bash shell running on Windows. It's an emulation layer at, at, uh, at syscall. And because it's just one function, you don't actually need to implement the whole interface, because it will compile, even if you only support the code for you know, even one uh, 
uh, of those, well, actually none of those uh, underlying syscall codes. So um, I don't know if this is absolutely true, but I heard that when Microsoft were uh, implementing this bash uh, emulation, they actually have implementation for about 200 of the 300 calls. So that probably says something about how 100 of those system calls are really not used very often. How do we know which system calls are being used? We already saw S-Trace showing us um, a kind of list of the, S, the, the system calls, and we can use the minus C, like count flag, to count them up and get a list of all of the syscalls that have been uh, used by that particular program. So if I want to run uh, my Hello GopherCon program on some other platform, I only need to have an implementation for these dozen system calls, and it would work, which would be pretty cool. OK, so that made me think, well, how does S-Trace know what system calls are being run? How does it get in to see what's, what's happening? And uh, it does it using a thing called ptrace, which is another system call, which uh, allows one process to observe and control what's going on in another process. It is super powerful. It lets you um, manipulate registers and memory from in that other process, which is kind of amazing and terrifying all at once. And it's primarily used to implement breakpoint debugging and system call tracing. OK. It's a system call. Um, just like the other system calls, um, the fact that this says syscall 6 is a, a very small detail about how um, the syscall function only lets you pass in, I think it's three or four parameters. And then there's another version called syscall 6 that lets you pass in six parameters. Really not very important. It, underlying this, it's exactly the same as syscall. We pass in this sysp trace. This is the um, Golang implementation, by the way. Pass in this, the ptrace system call code, just like usual. And then we also have a, um, a request parameter here. And this is because ptrace is kind of special and has a whole bunch of subcommands. The Golang syscall package actually sort of wraps up some of those uh, subcommands into functions, gives us a nice convenient way of accessing those functions. It's not actually all, not all of the ptrace subcommands are implemented in this way, but quite a few of them are. And I think it gives us an idea of the kind of things you can do with ptrace. So for example, we can get the registers from a particular process. We can look at data inside a process. We can change data inside a process. We can set the value of registers. And we can single step through on like a machine code instruction single step level. So it's really, you can do some really detailed stuff here. So I thought, well, let's build our own S-trace with the power of P-trace. So let's do it. I've got a little bit of code to start us off with. Come on. Uh, so at the moment, this is just going to let us basically start another process and run any arbitrary command. So it'll tell us what it is that we passed in. Let's say we, um, we invoke it and we say echo hello. It'll say it's going to run echo hello. And then it will create a command. Wire up stood in, stood out, stood er, so we can see what's going on. At this point here with the start, we actually create a new process and run whatever the command is, echo hello or whatever. And then we're going to wait for that process to finish. So super easy at the moment. And uh, let's just uh, we'll just build that. And uh, let's try running it on uh, that Hello GopherCon program. Oops, hello. OK, so we can invoke the Hello program from inside this program. But it's really not very exciting at this point. 
let's enable p-tracing. So we do that by um, passing in some sysproc attributes. Syscall, sysproc attributes. And we say p-trace. Yes, please. OK, so let's see what difference that makes. So we can see it tells us that it's uh, in some kind of stopped breakpoint state. But then we also see the output, hello, GopherCon. So how's that working? To illustrate, I'm just going to put a little delay in here. Um, we'll just sleep for like a couple of seconds. Okay. Build it and run it. So we see this trap happens immediately, but we don't get the output for a couple of seconds. And what's happening is uh, we start that child process. P because it's being traced, or because P-trace is being enabled, it gets put into this kind of wait breakpoint state, just like you know, putting a breakpoint into debugging code. Meanwhile, our sort of parent process uh, comes here, does the sleep for a couple of seconds, then it exits. Once it finishes, there's nothing to hold that breakpoint up anymore, so the child process is allowed to proceed, and then it does its output as it would normally have done. So that's why that's kind of happening in that order. We'll take that sleep away. Okay. So we've got our child process stopped. And I would like to see what, uh, what the state of the registers are at that point. And we can do that with a syscall. Syscall uh, ptrace. Get, so it's actually a ptrace sub command, get registers. We specify the process ID, which uh, we will get for, it's conveniently available for the process we just started. And we're going to write the state of the registers into a structure. Um, ooh, let's print that out. So, um, print. so we'll print out everything we can possibly find out about this structure. And I just need a variable for it, which is ptrace reg. Right. Um, also, if anything goes wrong, let's panic. Yeah. OK. So, build it. Obviously, I'm writing into it. Let's try that again. Build, run. OK, so we've got back a structure that tells us the current state of all of the registers in that child process at the point where it's been stopped in our breakpoint. Now, cast your mind back a few slides, and you'll remember that it was the AX register on the x86. But I'm sure you all remembered it was the AX register. <laughs> so. You might expect that uh, we would get the, the current syscall from RAX in this structure. For when I was researching this, uh, the best explanation I could find for why it's actually original RAX, the best explanation I've found so far is technical reasons. I'm not very satisfied with that, but I don't know the answer to why it's original RAX. But that's where the syscall code is. So, rather than printing out the, um, the whole registers, let's just get the name of that. Um, I have a little bit of convenience code, um, which I will make available later, but we can, you know, it's very, you know, very simple to convert the code into a name. Uh, so, we'll print out 
a name. And I just need to set that up. Syscall counter. Okay, don't worry about that. Okay, so that should tell us what the um, syscall is that we're currently sort of executing in that, or that we have just currently executed in the child process. Okay, let's try it. Oh, it's RAX, isn't it? Feel free to shout out if you see me doing a typo, that is fine. Okay, so it's told us that the syscall we were executing there was exec VE, and that makes a lot of sense because the exec VE syscall is what is used to create a new process and run the command that we want to run in it. So, perfect. So, we've kind of S-traced the first of our syscalls. Now we want to know what happens next. So we want the child process to be able to run until it hits the next syscall. And there's a convenient ptrace subcommand that, uh, that lets us do this. So ptrace syscall says restart the process that we're tracing and stop it again when we hit the next system call. And that's going to look like a sig trap to the calling process or to the monitoring process, the tracing process. So I should be able to just do ptrace syscall, process ID. If anything goes wrong, we will collapse. That is a typo. And uh, so that's going to take us to the next system call. But we need to um, wait for that sig trap in the, the parent process. So um, this, there's a convenient wait for. I don't really know whether it's called wait for, because that sounds like waiting for, or whether it's the fourth implementation of wait. Could be either of those things. All right, um, let's do the same thing. OK, so once we've got that um, wait for has finished, we want to do the same thing again about looking at the registers and printing out the name of the syscall we've just seen. So rather than type the code in again, let's just create a nice loop for it. So all of this stuff is in a loop. OK, so we're just going to loop around, getting the current uh, syscall, printing it out, letting the code run to the next syscall, and, and waiting for that to, to actually happen. So, build it, run it. OK, there is good news and bad news here. The good news is we've got a bunch of system calls being traced out. The bad news is kind of obvious. We've got a panic, no such process. Oops. And um, didn't mean to do that. Um, so it's happened at line 37. We can uh, find out what was going on there. and. We've clearly tried to get the registers from a process that doesn't exist. Uh, the best explanation for that is that the process is actually finished. So um, this doesn't have to be production quality code, right? Let's just assume that if we hit this error, the underlying child process has done what it's done. So we'll just break out at that point. OK, let's give that a whirl. So again, good news and bad news. Good news is we've got past that panic, but there is something suspicious about how all of these syscalls kind of come in pairs. And also, if we look at uh, you know, the bit that's really doing the thing we're interested in, writing hello gophercon to the screen, it's, well, the text is sandwiched between two write calls. And we know that's not, you know, it's not being called twice. And there was a clue here. It did actually say we'll get uh, the, the tracing will get stopped at entry to or, or exit from a system call, 
we dig into the man page a bit further. So the tracy enters a stopped state just before the syscall is executed, and it enters another stopped state when the system call has completed. Those two stop states are indistinguishable from each other, and it is our responsibility to keep track of which one of those things is happening. I'm not making this up. This came from the man page. Right. OK, so when we got that first exec VE, I'm pretty confident that it must have completed because we've got a new process. So I'm going to say that we start with an exit. And then uh, every time through this loop, we're going to flip between entries and exits. So we'll just flip. OK. And then we will only get the registers and uh, print out the name of what we've traced if we've just completed that uh, syscall, if it's an exit. OK. So let's try this one more time. That's looking pretty convincing to me. We've got uh, individual system calls being, you know, we're not seeing those doubled up system calls. The one last thing I'd like to do is sum them all up so that we can compare it to, um, to the output from strace. Uh, I am going to slightly cheat here with some code I wrote earlier. So this little convenient function that will uh, increment a counter for each different, I'll spell this right in a minute, there we go. And at the end, it will print it all out. Okay. Okay, so we can see a summary of how many different uh, times each system call got called. Let's just compare that to um, the strace output. So, and if we can fit it all on the screen, we can see actually these are pretty similar. So we've got one write, seven m maps, one m unmap, and so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we have just implemented Sistra or strace in 60 lines of code, which is pretty cool. Ship it, right? <laughs> OK, so um, one last little thing that we can do with um, sys Well, there's probably a million other things we can do with syscalls, but the thing I'm going to talk about is how we can um, use them to help with security of our code that's you know, executing in the world. So there's a principle in security called least privilege. This is the idea that you give an entity the sort of most restrictive permissions you can, um, and then that will make everything more secure. It's the same principle as, you know, if you've got a safe, you don't tell everybody in the world what the combination is to that safe. You don't, you tell as few people as possible. So, we just saw that Hello World only needed to use, I don't know, a dozen different syscalls. Uh, we know that of the 300 possible syscalls, maybe you know, only 200 of them are ever really used. And we also know that ptrace, for example, is really, really dangerous because it lets you manipulate other executing functions. So what if we were able to say this particular process is only allowed to execute a subset of the possible syscalls? And this makes a lot of sense if you've got a microservice architecture. Like if you've got a big monolith, it probably needs to do everything, so it's maybe not quite so sensible. But in a microservices world, you're going to have lots of different pieces of code that only need a subset of the syscalls. So um, there, is, there are a few different approaches, a few different um, kernel security modules for doing this. We're going to talk about one that's called setcomp. So you can set up a set comp profile describing which syscalls a piece of code is allowed to use or not allowed to use. And Docker, for example, lets you specify a set comp profile, and then it applies it to that particular container that you're running. So that's something you can do in the real world. Um, a set comp profile, this is uh, an example of one that uh, Jess Frizzell uh, put on the internet. Um, 
The thing about SETCOM profiles is they are quite long. I don't know if this is big enough to see, but uh, it's like 1,500 lines of code in a typical SETCOM profile. Um, so they could be a little bit painful to um, maintain if you've got hundreds and hundreds of different microservices. That's one of the reasons why security companies like Aqua exist, to help manage this kind of thing. But you can do it yourself. And uh, let's, let's see how this works. Let's see how SetComp does what it does. So in the interest of time, I am going to slightly cheat. I tried to squeeze this in, and I can't type fast enough. So here is a function I wrote earlier called disallow. So we're going to pass in the name of a syscall that we want to disallow. We're going to find out what the, the ID for that syscall is. And then we're going to create a set comp filter. When we create the new filter, we give it this uh, default allow. So by default, you're allowed to do any syscall. But then we add a rule that says, if you see that particular syscall we're, we're bothered about, uh, return a, an error code. And we're going to return EPERM, which is operation not permitted. And then we apply this filter. So let's try that in here, in the piece of code we had earlier. So let's try disallowing our friend, oops, right. OK. So we need to go build. And let's do Myas trace echo hello. So it traced out what it was going to do, and then it didn't write anything else to the screen. Because it can't, because I've disallowed write. And that's kind of, well, OK, it works, but it's not really very convincing, is it? Like, you can't see what's going on. So let's try doing it with another, um, another uh, syscall. Let's, before we do that, just uh, check uh, what echo hello actually uses. Uh, candidates that I'm going to pick arbitrarily, as if I had never tried this before, is uh, open. So let's change this to open. So it's going to be allowed to do everything except open. And we'll build that, run it again. OK. And we can see that we did hit uh, operation not permitted, exactly as we expected. And it hit that error while it was trying to open a file. It works. That's how SETCOMP works. That is the demonstration of SETCOMP. <laughs> OK. So just to summarize, even though, well, hands up any of you who have ever actively sort of written the word syscall in any of your code before. So actually, a, a few of you have. And the rest of you, never realized, probably, that you were actually calling syscalls all the time. Your kid is using this stuff every single day of your programming life, even if you're not um, consciously calling those um, syscalls. I think it's really interesting the way that um, they all boil down to this same mechanism of setting up the registers and triggering a, a trap. I think that's pretty interesting. And um, the fact that you can use them for emulation and, and portability is, is kind of cool. Um, We've seen how you can use strace to, to see what syscalls are being called. We've seen how you can, well, we've, we've scratched the surface, really, of what you could do with ptrace, because you can manipulate so much with that. And then we've also seen how you can use security profiles to limit what a particular process is allowed to do in terms of syscalls. I will um, be putting that code on the internet. I'm afraid I didn't quite have time to do that already, but it will be at strace from scratch. And uh, we have a few minutes between now and lunch where you can ask some questions.